Today you welcome to Wisdom Academy. Today we are looking at part three of uh, our physics, May, June, paper 4, 1, 2018. So in part one we looked at question one to four, part two we look at question four to eight, part three we are going to look at question nine to eleven. So without much ado, let's uh, begin. Now the first question here for part three is a student wants to de uh, demagnetize a permanent bar magnet. She suggests these steps. Now, these are the steps she suggested. She said, place the magnet in a long coil. Switch on a large alternative current in the coil. Switch off the current. Remove the bar from the coil. Now state and explain whether the steps will always be able to demagnetize a magnet. So I think it's no, these steps will not be effective. Some of the points are correct, but some are not. So you place the magnet in a low coil. So if you place a magnet in a low coil, how does that demagnetize the magnet? They switch on a large alternative current in the coil. If you switch on a large alternative current, how do you demagnetize a magnet? You are actually magnetizing it more. Switch off the current, yes. This point will demagnetize. Remove the bar from the, the coil, yes. This also could also demagnetize. So, point one and two magnetizes, point three and four demagnetizes. So, we uh, obviously say no. We say no to this. We say because, why we say no? Because the point do not outrightly demagnetize the magnet. So the point do not outrightly demagnetize the magnet. So we say no. It says state and explain whether these steps will always, will always, so this step, see, this is, will always, will it always? No. So will always demagnetize the, the magnet. We'll be able to demagnetize the magnet. So we say, even if it will not be effective because some, some of the points are there that can demagnetize, but some of them will not. We actually magnetize the magnet. We correct on, or if you have an alternative current, okay, it should not be switched off. Okay, so magnet should be withdrawn from the coil. This point is correct. Magnet should be withdrawn from the coil. So these are points we we go to write we go to uh, note down. Another point is magnet will be alternatively magnetized in different directions because from here the magnet will be magnetized. It will not be demagnetized. Switched on a large alternative current. So you see the magnet will be mag uh, magnetized. So we can we can actually say the reason why we say no is because the magnet will be will be magnetized largely due to the alternative current. Largely due to alternative the presence of alternative current. So, for this reason, brings us to the point why we say no. That the magnet will, will be heavily magnetized. Will be heavily magnetized. Because they are asking us to state and explain whether these steps will always be able to demagnetize the magnet. We say no. It will not always be able to demagnetize the magnet because of the huge presence of an uh, alternative current. And we say it will remain magnetized in all directions. Okay? It will remain magnetized in all directions. So once you give the no and two point, let's say we give another point.
okay we say we remain magnetized in the in the direction occurring at the moment of switching off that could also be a point we could also say that with current on the alternative current should not be switched off With current, the alternative current should not be switched on, switched off. Alternative current should not be switched off. Switched off if the current is on. I hope the current is flowing. So with this, you'll be able to get your three points for this. Now let's go to the B, the second part of the question. It's a figure on figure uh, 9.1. Is a figure 9.1 shows. Sorry, okay. Figure 9.1 shows. Okay, figure 9.1 shows, sorry, I have to respond quickly to something. Figure 9.1 shows a coil supplied with current using a split ring commutator. Figure 9.1 shows a coil supplied with current using a split ring commutator. So we can see, let's see if this is a generator or electric motor. Okay, it's using a battery. So this is an electric motor. Remember for generator, there is no battery. You can have a galvanometer to just measure the deflection of the current, to measure the current produced. A galvanometer or an ammeter here, uh, or micrometer, to measure the current that is produced. Uh, these are slip ring commutator. These are two cable brushes. Here is a cable brush. Here is a cable brush upon which this wire is connected. This cable brush is uh, this wire is connected to the wire upon which the current flows. It's connected to this cable brush here on this side and here on this side. And these are the two slip ring commutator. And these are the coil. The wire continues and it is wounded round in a rectangular format. And these are magnets. The magnet is a bit curved somehow to allow this uh, rectangular array of coil to wind, to rotate, to rotate. Okay, so this is what we have. Now let's see, let's see the question that comes. Is a state and explain any motion of the coil? State and explain motion of the coil. Okay, we say the coil, coil we rotate, right? The coil we ro rotate, and we will state the direction of rotation as well. We say the coil we rotate. the coil will rotate or slash turn turning turning effect remember for electric motor we talk about the turning effect so we say we rotate or turn that's one point it's three marks so we have to give three points now we will talk about the direction of rotation we will talk about the direction of rotation so if the current, look at the current, you have to look at the direction upon which the current flows. This is the positive arm of the battery. So current flows like this. So current goes like this. So as current is going up this way, going this way, the turning will be, the force will be down. Since current is flowing up from here, since current is flowing up this way, the turning, the rotate, the force will be down. So since the force is acting downwards here, and when the current flows and get to this other side, this other side, the current will be flowing downwards now. And the force will go upward. So this upward force from here, we can, we can show the force with an arrow here. And we can also show the force with an arrow on this side. We can also show the force with an arrow on this side. So these two forces will cause a clockwise rotation. 
So if you look at it, because the force here is pulling it down. The force here is pulling it down and the force on the other side is pulling it up. So this will cause, if you have a phone, you can, you can start to do a, a rotation like this. You do a rotation, a clockwise rotation. So this will cause a clockwise rotation. So we put that as a point here. We put that as a point here. We say it will result to clockwise rotation. It will result to clockwise rotation. A continuous clockwise rotation. So this will result to a continuous cl clockwise rotation. This will result to a continuous 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 clockwise rotation. So what we uh, uh, what we want to see here is the rotation is the clockwise, the direction of rotation. That's what we are keen about for this uh, particular point. This point we already measure rotate. Here we are keen about the clockwise, the direction of rotation. Okay, we are keen about the direction. Then we will have to measure about the current. The current in the coil reverses every half turn. We have to let them know because this current we reverse once this slippery commutator already have a full turn, half turn, which is like 180 degree. You know, the full turn is 360 degree. So when you reach 180, the current reverses. So we can simply say current will reverse in every half turn, which is after 180 degree. Okay. So we say the current will reverse in every half turn. The current will reverse in every... Okay, I changed to blue. Oh, not the background color. The background color should be white. The color... Blue. Just a moment, okay? On this Okay, now we say that uh, we say something. Okay, we say the current will reverse its direction. in every half turn or half circle you know full circle of rotation is 360 so we say half circle which is 180 in every half circle or half turn so whichever way you put it, you'll see in all in order. Okay. So these three points will earn us these three marks for this electric motor. Remember, a good example of electric motor, it's uh, your hair dryer, uh, drill, electric drill. Uh, so many things you use uses the motor, like your washing machine uses the electric motor, uses the motor, refrigerator uses the motor, your clipper. The one we use for cutting hair, they use the motto. So uh, in motor, the difference between a motor and a generator is that a motor, current has to be supplied to produce that turning effect, to produce motion. So you have to supply current with a battery or with a power source to produce the turning effect. Okay? To produce that turning effect, to produce the motion. Uh, it is that turning that drives whatever action you want to apply at the applicability. It is the turning that drives the, the characterization of the application of the, of the device. Okay, or like generator. In generator, it is the turning that produces the electricity. It is the turning. In generator, you find a way to, to keep the coil rotate, 
and when they do, they produce electricity. In electric motor, you use electricity to cause the rotation. So it's vice versa. Okay, so let's move on to the next question quickly. Okay, so we've, uh, we have a share of this. Question 9, B, Roman figure 2. Let's take a look at this, what they want us to do, what we have to do, and we get it uh, cute. Okay, now, uh, it said the coil in figure 9.1 consists of three tons of wires. Now, the magnetic field strength of this magnet is M. So, for these three tons of wire, the magnetic field strength is M. With a current of 2 amperes in the coil, the coil experiences a turning effect T. So, the coil experiences a turning effect T. Now, the first rule of table 9.1 shows this data. Now, let's take a look at table 9.1. We have, in this, on this table, or in this table, we have a number of tons provided, and then we have the current in the coil, the current, the amount of current that is flowing in the coil, and then we have the magnetic free strength that is provided and the turning effect. Now, for three uh, coil, or for three tons, we have current of two amperes, and we have magnetic free strength M, like the example they've stated, and we, we have a turning effect T. We have a turning effect T. Now, for another three ton, but the current this time around has been increased. For the same three ton, for, on the second example, the current has been increased four times. If the current is increased four times, if the current is increased four times, but the magnetic field was not changed. Remember, if you want to increase the turning effect, current is one of the factors that we use to increase the turning effect. So if the current is increased four times, what do you think will happen to the, even if the magnetic field strength is still M, the turning effect will let increase. The turning, because it will be four times increase. So we say 4T. So this one will become 4T. Why is it 4T? Because the turning effect will be 4T. Why? Because we have increased what? We have increased the the current four times the original value. The, the original value is two ampere. If you move the current value to eight ampere, if you move the current value to eight ampere, what it means is that you have uh, you have uh, uh, four times increased the original value. So if you four times increase the original value, it means the turning effect will be turned four times. The ability, the capability of turning will be four. four four times the original turning effect. Now we go to the second one. We have decided in this second one to increase to increase the number of tons. It's also a factor. Uh, number of tons is also a factor used for increasing the current. It's also a factor used for increasing the, the turning effect. It's also a factor used for increasing the turning effect. So we have, what did we do to it? We have uh, doubled it. We've moved from 3 to 6. We've moved from 3 to 6. So meaning we've doubled the number of tons. So it means that the turning effect we have, even if the current is two, same as the original one, and the feet, magnetic field strength is same as the original one, but the turning effect, because this is also a factor, since this is also a factor, and you have doubled this, the turning effect will be 2T, 2T. The turning effect, because you have doubled it, is twice the original, uh, the number of tons is twice the original value, meaning you have doubled it, you move twice, you multiply 3 by 2. Because you multiply 3 by 2 in order to get your, your ton, the new tons, the new number of tons, so you also multiply to get 6, you know, you multiply 3 by 2 in order to get this 6. So, therefore, you also multiply this by 2. You also multiply this by 2 in order to get, in order to get uh, uh, 2t. In order to get 2t. Is that okay? So, that's, uh, that's the logic and that's uh, what it takes to do, to do this type of question. Then the last one, we left the number of tons to be 3. So, we didn't increase the tons, the coets. We left the current to be 2 ampere, which is the original value. We didn't increase the current, but we have the magnetic field. So if you have the magnetic field, because magnetic field is also 
be produced by the magnet is also a factor. These three are factors that increases the turning effect. So since you have the magnetic field, the turning, the turning effect will also be half. It will be T divided by 2. The turning will be halved. It will be T divided by 2. The turning will be halved. It will be T divided by 2. So this is uh, for this. This is how we figure out this. And then probably you get whatever that you're supposed to get. I think this one, how many marks is this question? Three marks. Right? Three marks. Okay. So they've given, oh, they've, we didn't even see this. They've given us the possibility. So it's like we're just taking from here to put here. So we have used this one, 40. We have used this one. Let's just circle the ones we've used. We've used this. We used, we've used this. And we've used 2T. We've used 2T. And we used T and T over 2. So these are the ones we've used. These are the ones we've used. And then we've got it that uh, question sorted out. Now let's move to, uh, to question 10 on transformer. This is on transformer. So we have videos on transformer. You can always refer to any of these topics. We have videos on uh, uh, generator. Uh, I think we will make a video on electric motor. Okay, so you can always refer to any of the videos uh, to help you or to to get an insight if you forgot any of these things. It is easy for the recordings to always give you an insight. Now let's take a look at uh, question number 10. Is a question 10 a is a explain why the voltage of the explain why the voltage of the supply to the primary coil of a transformer must be alternating. Okay. <laughs> why at least we need to give two points here. Why should the voltage that is why is it always that the voltage we use for the primary side of the transformer? Why should it be an alternative current or alternative voltage? Why? This is the primary side of this transformer, and this this is the secondary side. We have 8,000 tons here. Or probably they're going to tell us how many tons, or probably they ask us to calculate the number of tons, okay, in the, on the secondary side. Now, the secondary side is powering a load. There's a bulb here. So, this secondary side of the transformer is powering a load. So, we're going to see what the question will ask us. But the first question is, why is it that the voltage that we always supply to the primary, always, always. We cannot use a direct current. We cannot use a direct current or a direct voltage. The voltage supplied here must always be a be an alternative current or alternative voltage. Why? Now the reason is that so that we can produce a changing magnetic field. The reason is that we so that we'll be able to produce a changing or alternative magnetic field that can be linked to the secondary side. You know, this is an empty space. This is an empty space. This is a, this is a core. C-O-R. This is core. C-O-R. I, soft iron core. Soft iron core. Okay? And these are coils. C-O-I-L. These are coils that are wounded around this core. And connected to a changing magnetic voltage. Changing magnetic voltage or changing magnetic current, uh, uh, alternative current, is the one from the government, the government supply. The direct one is the battery one. So we don't use battery for transformer. That's the point we're making here. We don't use battery for transformer. We use the, if you're in Malaysia, we say Tenaga National. If you're in uh, Nigeria, you say Power Holding Company of Nigeria. Uh, so, it depends on the country you are, uh, that determines the name of the, uh, the electricity regulatory body or supply body of that country. So that's the, that electricity is an alternative uh, current or alternative voltage. So the question is, like, why is it that in the design of the transformer, it's, it's made in such a way that we can only use a changing magnetic uh, uh, voltage? The reason is that... We, so that we can produce a changing magnetic field or flux that can be an alternative or changing magnetic flux that can be linked to the secondary side. So the reason is that so that
Okay. Why do we have to supply a voltage? Uh, to produce, we say to produce, also as to produce, so as to produce a change. You can say change or alternative. Alternative magnetic field or feed flux or magnetic feed flux. A change or alternating magnetic field. Magnetic field. Okay. We make that a point. The next one, we separate the points so that we can get our marks. We should do the modeled up everything in one point. So we, the next one we can say that can be linked to the secondary side through the soft arrow code that can be linked to the secondary side of the transformer secondary side of the transformer that can be linked to the secondary side of the transformer so, so in order to induce EMF in order to induce this is very important EMF in order to induce EMF or current okay so this is important once you give this point since it's just two marks I think these two points will suffice if not would have uh, would have if they wanted three points this last point we can split it to two if 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 it was three marks we can say that can be linked to the secondary side of the transformer full stop you go to you go to the third one you say to produce emf induced uh, to induce uh, emf electromotive force or current that would have been your third point but we combine the two and uh, second and third point together and, and we move on okay so we go to the next question, the B. Uh, transformer, uh, figure 10.1 shows a transformer. So we've seen this transformer, we know the number of tons, so we're going to write our parameters and then we will see what they want us to do. There are 8,000 tons in the primary uh, coil of the transformer. So N, NP is, NP is 8,000. NP equals... Eight thousand. Okay, so there are eight thousand. There are eight thousand tons in the primary coil of the transformer. The primary coil is connected to a two hundred forty volt. The primary coil is connected to a two hundred forty volt main supply. So VP, because the voltage in the primary is 240 so we say we simply say vp is equal to 240 volts votes. okay Now, a current, uh, a 6.0 volt lamp connected to the secondary coil operates at full brightness. So, Vs, the voltage in the secondary is 6 volts. So, Vs, Vs voltage in the secondary is equal to 6 volts. Voltage in the secondary is equal to 6 volts. So, obviously, they ask us to find the number of tons, NP. You see, that value is not given. Number of tons in the primary. 
and the number of turns in the primary which is unknown equal to unknown so we're going to find np we're going to find np so he said calculate the secondary which operates at full brightness calculate the number of turns in the calculate the number of turns sorry we're going to find ns you know we have np already okay we're going to find ns We already have NP, number of tons in the primary. It is this one, number of tons in the secondary, we want to find. We have the number of tons in the primary, we want to find the number of tons in the secondary. So it's a calculate the number of tons in the secondary coil. So we say uh, NP, whichever you start with first. You can start with NP, but if you start with NP, you must also start with VP. NP over the formula, NP over NS. NP over NS is equal to VP over VS. Is equal to is equal to VP is equal to VP over VS. So we put our value. We make. We make uh, so since we are looking for N NS, we can make it the subject of formula straight away. So to do that, you can cross multiply. So you say NS. If you cross multiply, you say NS multiplied by NS multiplied by VP, right? If you are cross multiply, I have NS times VP. NS times VP. Will be equal to NP times VS. NP will be equal to NP times VS. Okay, so since we are looking for NS, we we'll just make it the subject. So I will just put the value, I will divide by the VP. Let's put the value of this one on the right side. NP is what? 8,000. NP is 8,000. So let's write 8,000. 8,000. 8,000 multiplied by... What's the value of VS? VS is 6. So 8,000 multiplied by 6. Divide by, we're going to divide by VP because we're looking for NS. In order to make NS the subject, we have to divide both sides by VP. So NS is equals to 8000 multiplied by 6, divide by VP. VP is what? 240. Divide by VP, which is 240. Two forty. Okay, so we 8,000 multiplied by 6, 8,000 multiplied by 6, divided by 240, so we get 200. So number of tons will give us 200. So our answer is 200 there, just 200, you don't need to write unit for tons, 200. So we get 200. So we'll move on. We'll get two marks for that. Now he said the current in the lamp is current in the lamp. Lamp is on the secondary side, right? The lamp or the bulb, right? The current, the current in the lamp is two ampere. 
The current in the lamp is 2 ampere. The transformer operates with 100% efficient efficiency. You know, once we tell you that transformer is 100% efficient, then we say IP, that's the, the power in the primary. IP, VP, that's power. You know, power is I, uh, IV. So we put P just to show that it's in the primary. IP, VP, that's the power in the primary is equal to power in the secondary. There will be no power loss. If a transformer is 100% efficient, but in practice, there is no transformer that is 100% efficient. These are theoretical assumptions. In practice, there are also there are losses, either due to eddy current losses, or due to heat losses, or due to, there are losses that will cause, thermal losses that will cause the transformer not to be 100% Efficient. Some of the energy will be converted to heat or thermal energy. So in reality, in reality, there is no there is no transformer that is 100 percent efficient, such that all the energy that goes into it is the same amount of energy that goes out of it. Or the power input input power is equal to output power is only theoretical. It's only for in theory. So you say calculate the current. The current in the primary. They want us to calculate uh, IP, current in the primary. This current they gave us, since they say the lamp. The lamp is only in the, on the secondary side of the transformer. Okay, so which is IS. IS is 2. So we just substitute. We're looking for IP. So IP, IP. IP is equal to the current in the secondary, which is 2, times the voltage in the secondary. Remember, they gave us, in the previous case, they've given us voltage in the secondary, which we call Vs, voltage in the secondary, which is 6. So we say 2 times 6, 2 multiplied by 6, 2 multiplied by 6, that's 12, right? 2 multiplied by 6, divide by... Since we are looking for this, we are looking for IP. Divide by this voltage, VP. And VP has been given to us also. VP is 240. Look at the previous case. VP is 240. So, you say 12 divided by 240. 12 divided by 240. What do we get? 12 divided by 240. We'll get 0 point, 0 0.05, right? So we get 0 0.05 ampere. So we get IP equal to 0 point. Zero point zero five. Ampere. Always write the unit. If you don't write the unit, they will presume that you don't know and you lose math. In physics, we don't put unit. It could be when you say 0 0.05, what? 0 0.05 banana? Is it 0 0.05 uh, granite? Is it 0 0.05? So you must state the unit in order to get the max. You must state the unit in order to get the max. Now let's go to the, 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 the top part of the question, which says the primary, the primary circuit contains a 2 ampere fuse. The primary circuit, look at the fuse in the transformer. Here, this is the fuse. This is the fuse. Okay, the primary circuit contains a, and this fuse is 2 ampere. You know the job of a fuse, right? The fuse is to protect the circuit. The fuse is to protect the circuit. Instead of uh, if there is too much current or too much, uh, yeah, too much uh, current flowing, instead of anything burning, the fuse will cut off. The fuse is to protect the transformer. Okay. Now we say the primary circuit contains a two ampere fuse. Calculate the maximum number of lamps identical to the lamp in in uh, Roman figure two 
that can be connected in parallel in the secondary circuit without blowing the fuse. <coughs> Excuse me. The maximum number of lamp that can be connected that can be connected here in in parallel. How many lamps can you make in parallel to each other without blowing the fuse? This second lamp, for example, you do another one, third lamp. They ask you how many lamp can you create like this? How many lamp can you create in in parallel like this without blowing the fuse? So that's what the question is. How many lamps can we create like this without blowing the fuse? How many lamps? So we continue. So to do that, this type of question, what we need to do is to understand the current. We calculated the current, right? The current that is flowing on the secondary side. On the, the current that is flowing on the primary side is uh, the current that is supplied here is 0 0.05 ampere and uh, the total current is uh, 2 ampere the fuse total current is 2 ampere the fuse total current is 2 ampere so what you do you divide the fuse current the maximum number of current of the fuse by the number of by the current that is flowing in the circuit okay on the primary side so we so that we know how many lamp this fuse can protect this two ampere fuse can protect in order to know how many lamp this fuse can protect you will say the number of current of the fuse the maximum current of the fuse divided by the current that is being supplied so in this case to know the number of a lamp you say current fuse current divided by circuit current fuse current Fuse current fuse current over fuse current over circuit current or primary circuit primary side of the circuit the current in it okay the current on the primary where the fuses the current on the primary where the fuses so which means the fuse the current of the fuse is two ampere we are saying the fuse can only protect up to a maximum of two ampere so that maximum of two ampere divide by by the current that is being supplied or that is flowing the primary divide by the current that is flowing in the primary so 2 divided by the current flowing in the primary. The current flowing in the primary is 0 0.05. 0 0.05. 0 0.05. So what do we get? Four zero. So meaning you can connect 40 bulbs. This fuse can protect up to 40 bulbs. It means this fuse can protect up to 40 bulbs. So we are done with question 10. Now we go to question 11 as fast as we can. Question 11 is on the radioactivity, nuclear physics. Question 11 is on radioactivity, which is a nuclear physics. Question 11 is on radioactivity, which is a nuclear physics. Okay? So we say, rather right done. Rather, 222 two, two is a radioactive uh, substance, it's a radioactive. It can be represented as, as this. The atomic number is 86. Atomic number is 86. Radom atomic number is 86. And, and uh, the mass number is 222. Two, two. So for a neutral atom of uh, radar 222, two, two, state the number of proton. Number of proton is the same as the atomic number. So the number of proton will be 86, right? Number of proton will be 86. So we write 86 here. So this is a free giveaway question. 
This is a giveaway question. So number. Okay, number of protons is it? Number of neutron. Okay, we do neutral last. Electron is same as proton. If it's a, if it's an atom. Or less is an ion. If it's an ion, the electron and the proton will not be the same. If it's an ion, meaning they write plus or minus in any in any atom. It will no longer be an atom, it will be an ion. So that's where the number of protons and the number of electrons will not be the same. But if uh, if an element is symbolized like this, without showing either positive or negative on top here, there is an atom. And if it's an atom, the number of protons is the same as the number of uh, electrons. Number of proton is same as number of electron. So we write 86 here. We write 86 here as well. Then for neutron, we do a little calculation for neutron. Neutron is just to say the mass minus the at, uh, number of proton. So you say 222 minus 86. For for you to get number of neutron, you say 226, 222. You say 222. Minus 86. Minus 86. 2 to 2 subtract 86. What do we get? That will be the number of neutron. What do we get? So we get 136. Right? We get 136. So for neutron, we get 136. 136 okay so we do this these three things we get these two marks now uh, we move on to the next question that they go to ask us okay question B is says a radon 222 nucleus decays by alpha particle aha uh -huh. decays by alpha particle emissions to a polonium to a polonium nucleus. Now complete the equation for the decay of radon. Okay, so radon will decay to produce polonium. So polonium, polonium we write PO, we write PO, these are polonium, plus an alpha particle. So Alpha, you can use the alpha symbol, you can use linear nucleus. You can use, you can either use this symbol, okay, or you use the HE, linear nucleus, okay. So here we have the alpha particle, the atomic number is uh, 2, and the mass is uh, 4. The mass is 4. So now the big question is, what will be the mass of polonium? So you subtract, you say 86 minus 2, 86 minus 2, you get 84 here. So that's how we get 84 for polonium here. Because it has emitted, this has emitted an alpha particle to produce a, it has emitted an alpha particle to produce a polonium. So since it has emitted an alpha particle, this polonium will lose two, two uh, atomic number here. So it will be 84. And then this one, 2 to 2, we subtract, we subtract 4. We say 2 to 2 minus 4. 2, 2, 2 minus 4. We get 218, right? 218. This will give us, this will give us 218. Two, one, eight. You should give us two one eight. So we come here. We write two one eight. Two one eight. Okay. So this is what is he say. This one is a complete equation for the. Decay of random two to two. So we've done that. You get your two marks if you're able to do this. You get two marks if you're able to do this. 
which is free two max anyway. Now you say Radio 222 has a half life of 3.8 days. A half life of 3.8 days. At a certain time, a sample of a sample contains 6.4 times 10 to the power of 6 radon nuclei. Calculate the number of alpha particles emitted by the radon by the radon nuclei in the following 7.6 days. So half one half life is 3.8. So 3.8 plus 3.8. I think we'll get 7.6, right? So we have it to half life. If we add 3.8 plus 3.8, that will give us two half lives. So the first half life is 3.8 days. The second half life is another 3.8 days, which gives a total of 7.6. Which gives a total of 7.6 days. Right? So since we know there are two half lives that will take place, now in the first case, we take a look at this uh, radioactive nuclear. This, this sample of a radioactive nuclear. Okay, we take a look at this sample of radioactive nuclear. So what we will do in the first half life, half of it will decay. So first half life. In the first half life, half of it will decay. So this is the, the nuclear 6.4. 6.4 times 10 to the power. 6.4 times. 10 to the power of 6. Okay, this is uh, the nucleus, what the nucleus contains. 6.4 times 10 to the power of 6. So in the first half life, half of this will decay, meaning we we'll divide by 2. In the first half life, half of it will decay. So what, what? Half will decay, half will remain. So what decayed will be, or what remain, We'll be writing what remain, we also write what, what decay. So what remain will be, if you divide 6.4 by 2, you get 3.2. So here we get 3.2, 3.2 times 10. Okay, I skipped the times 10 to the power of 6, is part of it. So this remain, and, and uh, also another 3.2 3 has decayed. Another 3.2 has decayed. Another three point two times ten to the power of times ten to the power times ten to the power of six has decayed. So I write decay here. So let's be right keep it the one that has decayed somewhere here and the one that remains here. So this is remaining. So we can write remaining here. Or we just write remain. So the one that remain we keep here. So times 10. This times 10 also to the power of 6. Okay. So that's the first half life. So we write first half life. First. First half life. HL. First half life. Now, second half life. For second half life. Remember, there are two half-lives. That's what we establish. 
in order to get 7.6 is 3.8 and 3.8. That's first half life, second half life. There are two half life. So in, on the second half life, second half life, second HL, then the remaining one, half of it will decay again. Not the 6.4, the remaining one. So this is, uh, remaining one will be divided by two. Half of it will decay. So on the second half life, this uh, 3.2 times 10 to the power of times 10 to the power of 6. Times 10 to the power of 6. Okay, times 10 to the power of 6. Times 10 to the power of 6. We'll divide it by 2. So another half will remain. So if you divide this by 2, you get 1.6, right? So 1.6, this will be, the remaining one will be 1.6. One point six times ten to the power of six. Okay, one point six times ten to the power of six. And then I know which you know if you divide by two, half remain, half decay. The one that decay, let's come and write it here, is also one point six. 1.6 times 10 to the power of 6. Just a moment. Okay, 1.6 times 10 to the power of 6. 1.6 times 10 to the power of 6. So this is the one that decayed in the second half life. On the second half life, this is what decayed. To the power of six. Okay. So, eventually, this what remains. But let's find out what the question one. Is it what remains the question one or what decayed? The question says calculate the alpha the number of alpha particles emitted by the radon, radon nuclear in the following seven. The one emitted. Okay, the one emitted is the one that decayed, right? So the one emitted is what decayed after these two half life. So the one that decayed is the one that has been emitted because it's emitted away, it's lost. That's the meaning, it's lost. Is degraded, is lost. Okay, so what remains is this 1.6. So to find what what uh, what has been emitted, you add this and this together. You can add this and this together, or you go and subtract this last one from the what remains from the original total. You can say this original total minus this uh, what remains. You find what has been uh, lost. So you just add six plus. Two, you get eight. You get eight here. And one plus four, one plus three, you get four. One plus three, you get four. So you get four point, this point is here. Four point eight times ten to the power of six. Always the power of six, you keep it like that, okay? If you do salt, how to add salt, you understand what we're saying times 10 to the power of 6. So this is what is emitted. Times 10 to the power of 6.
times 10 to the power of 6. Don't mind my writing, okay? So that's your answer, 4.8. Four point eight multiplied by ten to the power of six. Four point eight times ten to the power of six. So that's your final answer. You get three marks for doing this calculation. You get three marks for doing this calculation. In some questions, they will ask you about what remains. If the question is asking you about what remains, the answer will be 1.6 times 10 to the power of 6. But if it's asking you about what is emitted or what, is, what has decayed, you add the total decay and you get what is uh, what has uh, the total decay, which is 4.8 times 10. Like I also said, you can also say 6.4 minus 1.6. You still get the 4.8, whichever method you want to use. So with this, we've uh, come to the end of our today's uh, class.